Welcome, everyone. I'm the founder of QuidRoom, the social platform where accredited investors and investment professionals globally find each other. Before we kickstart, for all the investors who are listening in to the session and the podcast, if any of your questions are unanswered or you just want to have a chat about investing, feel free to reach out to hundreds of investment experts globally by joining their communities now live in QuidRoom. To attend future similar sessions, you can join hundreds of other investors in my personal QuidRoom community. The community handle is posted in the comments here. Now, let's get on with today's topic. Southeast Asia is becoming more and more mature as a VC market with more than 50 unicorns in the region. Accelerated internet penetration, the Southeast Asian consumer can expect exponential innovations in this space in the coming years. Today, we have one of Quidroom users and community owners, Hurston Powers, GP at 1982 Ventures, who is in the midst of this financial revolution of this region. Hudson, how are you doing today? Very well. Thank you for having me. Thanks for being part of this uh, AMA session. Off the bat, you strongly believe that the fintech space in so Southeast Asia is where investors are supposed to be. Tell me what made you leave your banking job and get on with this journey of being a full-time investor in this space. Yeah, sure. I guess the short answer is that this is a once in a lifetime opportunity and you don't necessarily hear that a lot because if you have basically been active in markets like China 10, 15 years ago, India before, we've kind of already seen this story a bit. And when I was sitting in the middle of Indonesia and, and Vietnam and Philippines and, and even Singapore, you could basically sense all the hallmarks of Things are really about to start here. And the VC and startup ecosystem had been kind of kickstarted. You started seeing some of those first uh, e-commerce businesses truly getting funded and scaling. And it became very clear that the next wave of unicorns would come from the fintech sector. Um, so it happens that I'm a financial services expert. My, my partner has also uh, has decades of experience in corporate finance and finance and microfinance. And I've also started a fintech company uh, in the past as well. So it's something, it's a space we knew and it was the right place, right time. It just happened to be the right two partners to, to launch a fund. So that would be, I guess, the, the most clear answer. But to be honest, I didn't have a choice. <laughs> okay. there, was, there, was no looking, there was no looking back. Um, I would have, you know, been 60, 70 years old and really kicked myself for not uh, launching this fund and going after the biggest uh, VC opportunity, um, at least for this generation. Since you're uh, talking about the biggest VC opportunity, you have got me intrigued. So that means let's get directly to the end point. So what is your Everest in Southeast Asia? That massive audacious undertaking that you're working towards. Yeah. So maybe let's let's just let's just tell everybody what 1982 Ventures is because we're probably a, yeah. a firm that probably most people on the street haven't heard of. But um, at least within seed stage or very early stage investing in Southeast Asia, uh, in fintech, um, we're, we're making a name for ourselves uh, quite quickly. We're now the most active fintech investor in Southeast Asia, and we've been around for two years. Uh, my partner and I, we launched 1982 Ventures to exclusively focus on investing in the best fintech founders in Indonesia, Vietnam, Singapore, Philippines, across Southeast Asia. And opportunistically, we look at Pakistan and Bangladesh just because those markets, um, they look and smell familiar, if you understand what I'm, I'm saying. And they're even further behind from, a, from an ecosystem uh, development standpoint. So uh, we invest about 250000 to 500000 U.S. dollars uh, mm -hmm. in a fintech startup. We generally like to be the first VC check a great startup uh, accepts. So um, we're, we're generally not hounding investor or sorry founders for revenue or um, uh, excessive amounts of traction we find the best founders who understand their market that are in that are going after a very large market and if if we believe in that then we write that check very early and we're rewarded handsomely uh for that so that's that's a little bit about 1982. And and how do you currently source for these uh, best fintech founders? Because you're really early on, right, when it comes to sourcing and the 250 and 500k check, if you want to be one of the first in, in institution investors. And 
sourcing, identifying them and investing into them, it's going to be a bit challenging. I just want to know the special formula that you have in place or whatever you can let out around it and any underrated tools that are indis indispensable for finding these opportunities right now. Sure. The real answer is that there's no secret sauce. This isn't, this isn't a part-time job. This isn't a side hustle. If you're an angel investor, you're not getting access to the best deals, full stop, unless you um, are a very, very well-known um, entrepreneur that founders respect, they'll, they'll come after you. But generally, you're not seeing the best deals as an angel, high net, or even family office. You're generally looking at the deals that VCs like 1982 passed on. Uh, if, if you're seeing the deal. So we do this a hundred percent of the time. All mm -hmm. we do is focus on sourcing, uh, for the best founders. So what the, what does that take? It takes a network that is built for purpose. And my network understands exactly what I'm looking for. I'm looking for very early stage fintech companies. Uh, and, and I actually have deal scouts in Ho Chi Minh, in Hanoi even in Singapore. I'm based in Singapore, but there's still, I guess, circles or networks that I will never have access to. I'm never going to be an Indonesian. I'm never going to be a Vietnamese or a Filipino local. So as a, a foreigner, an American sitting in Southeast Asia, I need to augment uh, my network as, as best as possible. But to be quite, I guess, direct, the best deal flow that, that 1982 receives uh, are from other founders. So founders that we've backed that are in our portfolio, founders that we've worked with in our past at our past fund or in our previous life as bankers and, and advisors, um, the, the founders that respect us, generally those founders will give us very positive references to any fintech founder. Say, if you're looking for that first check, go to 1982. If you already have uh, some of the bigger investors on, still get 1982 because they understand fintech and we work harder than any VC to, to provide value to our, to our, um, to our portfolio company. So that would be the best source is great founders generally, uh, hang out with other great founders. Another kind of special characteristic of 1982 is that many of the GPs of the funds in Southeast Asia, I can't say their names are personally invested in our fund. And generally, mm -hmm. they're investing at Series A and Series B. So there's a lot of deals that are just too early for them. Uh, they respect our company selection when it comes to fintech. Uh, so they've invested in our fund, and then they'll show us those deals. And then, um, quote unquote, we do the dirty work. <laughs> you know, we we clean up the cap table. We help the co the company uh, with their equity fundraising story and get them uh, ready for that Series A. So those would be the probably the two best sources for us uh, for deal flow. But it's building a reputation, a brand. Uh, and credibility where the best founders want to work with you. And that's that's what we attempt to do every day. It's pretty interesting that you brought this up, uh, Heston, because I, and this is something that I have been very vocal about, do not invest through the pigeonholed view that your WhatsApp group says that these are the five startups that you should invest into. I always say that to the high net with individuals, to not only believe in that because there's a wider market and maybe you're not getting the best deals. You need to actually have a better, you need to always focus on better access, especially in private markets and focus on working with people who have better access. Uh, but this has always, in, and, and I'm sure this is going to be relevant for the large number of high net worth investors who are going to be listening into this. A lot of them have always mentioned, uh, we, not a lot, minority actually. Other than our personal network, we also are part of quite a bit of crowdfunding sites where we feel that the, the sourcing is done and uh, and and good investment opportunities are identified by these crowdsourcing websites. So uh, so we usually end up investing with the opportunities that they present. Now, do you think that is a good or bad strategy for a high net worth individual, or are people going to lose their lunch, or should they should they change their strategy around it or their mindset around it? Sure. I I guess it depends what your goals are and what your preference is with respect to where you want to enter a company in the VC uh, life cycle. So if you're trying to invest in late stage, growth stage startups that may have secondaries or have potentially put themselves up on, on a crowdfunding site, then that's fine. Uh, then, then, then you can maybe participate in, in some of those secondaries 
uh, or even primary if, if, they, if that particular platform has allocation. I will say if you're trying to do seed stage or early stage is in seed stage is where you find the ability to, to generate the highest returns in venture capital. Um, if you're trying to do that, um, it's probably not a good strategy. If a seed stage company or pre-seed company has already resorted to putting themselves on a crowdfunding site, it's probably not a good company, uh, or uh-huh. say not a good company. That's, that's probably too harsh. Uh, but it's, it's, it's probably a company that's having trouble raising VC, uh, money. And again, not every company needs to, to take VC dollars, but if you're looking for a company that's going to have exponential growth that has the potential to be a unicorn, it's probably going to get on that VC track, uh, nine times out of 10. So that's probably not the best source of, of deal flow. Um, I'm a little bit biased here, but a small fund that's focused on venture capital. Uh, mm-hmm. like 1982, um, accepts individual, uh, or AI or accredited investors as LPs of our fund and not for a crazy amount either. I mean, our fund is closed. We closed at about 20 million, uh, about two months ago, but we've had investors that are accredited that did not put a significant amount, but they just put a small LP ticket into 1982 to get access to the deals. And mm-hmm. we've already made 24 investments in our portfolio. I can say, that uh, a very significant portion of those uh, investments have been available to our investors for co-investment at no, <laughs> you know, go direct. Uh, you know, we're not going to block that if the founder likes you. And then when the, the companies get to a little bit larger scale, we can create vehicles so that you can participate in that. <laughs> so I would recommend, you know, utilize your own angel networks. You can <laughs> look at the crowdfunding sites for particular types of deals that you might be interested, but more than likely, Finding a, a fund with a strategy that's aligned to something that, that you're interested in, that allows for co-investment, that doesn't just say they give co-investment, but actually has a track record of giving their LPs access to deals, uh, is probably going to be where you get the, the best deal from. Interesting. Thanks. Uh, that was more of a generic question. Now, I'm going to be a bit more specific with Southeast Asia, right? Because uh, just to be, um, and again, we need to understand exactly what the high net worth individuals and their the the perspectives in here, but some of that is important to know because you have, you know what the market pulse is. So from your view, and just like how, and I want a strong biased view on this. From your biased strong view, what is the biggest mistake or misconceptions that currently high net worth individuals have? Yeah, mistakes that they're making as well. That's an interesting question because, um, you know, RLPs range from, you know, the largest Indonesian conglomerate to multinationals like Genting to fund of funds in the U.S. to family offices from uh, Southeast Asia, Middle East, Europe to high net worth individuals as well. And I would say that all of them make the same mistake. <laughs> so, okay. It's, it's not just in, in uh, how they are accessing Southeast Asia fintech. Sector, no, is it? Think, you know, because that's that's what I wanted to know. I, I, like, what have you noticed? I think that at least what we've seen is that many investors uh, don't understand that Southeast Asia has really just started its fintech journey. We're just starting the wave of of starting to see fintech unicorns. You know, in the last eighteen months, where the first fintech unicorns were birthed out of Southeast Asia, this is incredible because if you look at China, India, U.S., Europe, even Africa, even Latin America, um, they've been there before. They've done this before. They've got fintech companies that are already listed in, in markets that, in our view, are less attractive than Southeast Asia. So we still believe that Southeast Asia is underlooked uh, and, and probably not getting the attention it deserves. The encouraging point is that we see investors like Hedda Sophia, Tiger Global, Insight, and others starting to be a bit more serious about this region. Whether they're committed to the region is uh, will, will remain to be seen, but we hope that this continues to basically be the start of a super cycle for fintech and venture capital. So the mistake is for most people thinking that, oh, I can transact uh, via an e-wallet, we're done here, or... There's a, there's a digital banking license now 
fintech is over is completely wrong. We're now starting to see that the, the foundation for a digital financial services ecosystem in Southeast Asia has been laid. And now more sophisticated fintech business models can be launched in this market. So it's not over. We're just starting. Put together the fact that with the listings of Grab, with GoTo, with Bukalapak, and the other forthcoming listings, this ecosystem is just going to get stronger and stronger, not just for fintech, but for venture capital in general. You're going to see better equipped founders with experience that have seen companies scale in this region with more access to capital and more access to better technology tools to actually launch these businesses. So the, the biggest mistake in our view or the biggest misconception for whether it's an individual investor or institutional investor is that, you know, Southeast Asia fintech, it's already happened. No, we're just getting started. And, and that brings, and, and it's good that you mentioned uh, go to and grab. They're, they're, they're great examples uh, for the next question, and which is a concern that was raised by one of the investors about investing into pure play retail fintech industry in Southeast Asia. Because what they find is that right now, the dominant players, fintech organizations that are there, did not start as a fintech company. They ventured into fintech, like how Grab did and GoTo did. Of course, now they are being perceived as a fintech organization, but they were not a fintech organization. So by investing in the retail space in fintech directly, is that also going to be taking up more risk than actually investing into something that may create more returns for you? So if I understand the question correctly, it's investing in B2C fintech business model? Correct. Into B2C fintech model, is it beneficial or should uh, should B2C fintech be looked at with a grain of salt? Because in the uh-huh. B2C fintech space, the other players that were not fintech traditionally are the ones who became the fintech dominant players. Yeah. So I would say I have so much respect for Grab and GoTo um, for, for getting those listings done and building great fintech businesses but they're not going to be the winners. That's clear. And I would challenge the view that they're dominant. Maybe in in some some areas in in e-wallets or payments, depending on how you you calculate um, the transactions going through. But nowhere in the world, outside of China, which is a special market, have you seen technology incumbents become the fintech champion of that market. And... Our view, and it may be contrarian, is that Grab is not going to win the digital banking race here. They've got a license, but they haven't even launched a digital bank from what what I can understand. I don't know anyone in Singapore that has a Grab uh, bank account yet, and they've had a license for a year, right? That's not how you build fintech businesses, straight up. Like, let's let's not play around here. Whether you're a traditional bank, uh, or a technology company that's trying to pivot to fintech, it's really difficult. It takes different muscles. It takes different skill set. It takes different talent. Uh, it takes a different approach to regulation to be a successful fintech. You got to start that from day one. That's why our view is that the digital banks that win in every market in Southeast Asia will be the ones that are ground or built from the ground up as fintech, as digital financial services from the start. So I guess I disagree. <laughs> And you are really passionate about that. <laughs> That's good. Look, it's, uh, it's, very look, clear. I'm... it's very clear. I mean, look at every market in the world, whether it's Transfer or Wise, Revolut, New Bank. Um, it, it wasn't uh, an e-commerce player that became the, the, the largest digital bank in, in Brazil um, or, or, or even in India. So let's, let's, um, let's, let's look at you know, what's worked in other markets. Not to say that that will be exactly what happens in Southeast Asia. But um, we're betting on fintech, and we we want to do early stage. Awesome. So we have a question. You have answered a portion of it, but then also I'm just going to quote him. Uh, will it be uh, possible for Hurston to also cover the opportunities for angel investors and high net worth individuals in the region? How to realize their potential as key contributors in supporting inclusive and impact oriented businesses, creating long term social impact in Asia? Ooh, that's a that's a great question. So. Full disclosure, 1982 Ventures is not an impact fund, uh, but we know 
that every investment that we make in the fintech sector in Southeast Asia is generally having that type of positive impact and helping to solve financial inclusion issues. So in our view, if that is something that you care about, doing good and making good returns, uh, fintech in places like Indonesia, places like Vietnam, where half the population doesn't have a bank account, nobody has access to debit cards and credit cards, basically. And businesses have a very hard time getting working capital or financing as well. So you've got this massive part of the economy that is growing, but not having, which is basically underserved from financial services. And in our view, fintech is what's going to really close that gap. And this is the time to basically be a part of that positive story where we can positively impact financial services in Southeast Asia. So I guess to be very direct, you know, work with people like ourselves, with, with incubators, with accelerators and, and seed stage funds like 1982 Ventures to start looking and learning more about this ecosystem. Because depending on what your expertise is, and I'm talking about the, that, that angel investor, there may be a number of great founders that would really just want to talk to you and get uh, a download of some of your expertise. And if you can show value that way to, to a startup founder very early, um, they may even offer you equity. And then you're going to start getting a reputation as somebody that, that actually provides value. And if you're, if you're working with a, a fund like us, I mean, I, let me give you a nice little anecdote here. Um, one of our investors is basically retired. You know, had done, done really well in banking, had invested in our fund and got really excited about one of our portfolio companies. Um, had un understood the model, understood the problems there. And uh, two months later became a co-founder of that portfolio company. Oh, wow. Right. You know, so it's just remarkable to see when you make that type of connection, uh, between, between an individual and a, and a portfolio company that, you know, real magic happens. And that company is, is doing some great work in getting, um, financial services to Indonesian farmers and traders. Uh, so really providing a uh, huge impact. So that's my view uh, on, on how to do it. There are plenty of other impact driven funds um, mm -hmm. that, that you can take a look at. Okay. But with us, sorry, but with us, you know, impact is basically embedded in our thesis and we don't necessarily have to uh, quote unquote greenwash uh, what we're doing. We're, we're investing in the best fintech companies and they're going to help solve financial inclusion issues. And we won't invest in anything that's predatory or unsustainable. Thanks for that. Um, there are two more questions. I'm going to go uh, with this one because you have already answered a portion of it. Uh, in the beginning, you mentioned about identifying right founders. I, as an angel investor, always find it difficult to dedicate a lot of time around identifying winning traits. Any tips around that? Yeah, so I understand your pain because um, being an angel investor takes a lot of time, um, not just for when you're evaluating a deal, but generally after you write that check, you're gonna be, you're gonna have to do a lot of work uh, for that founder to make sure that uh, your investment keeps keeps um, keeps working or stays solvent. So um, I don't have any tips what we look for is obviously domain expertise um someone that understands their market inside and out we we you know some simple kind of checklist if they're a part-time founder that's generally a no um if if they've got a a very let's call it heavy management team uh at such an early stage and you can kind of look at their salaries and say this is not what a startup looks like that's another uh, kind of red flag, but, um, outside the, the domain expertise, you're, and, and someone who knows their market inside out, you're looking for someone that has true grit and has the ability to persevere because any entrepreneur, uh, can tell you this is the hardest job in the world, no matter what kind of startup you're doing. Um, and if they don't have that constitution or that conviction, that they are really going to leave it all out in the fields, uh, for lack of a better analogy. 
um, then you probably don't want to be working with them. You probably don't want to invest your money in a founder like that. So what we've done, and again, there's no quick tips here, is incredible amount of reference checks. Uh, we, we obviously ask the founders for, um, you know, who they would like us to speak to, but then we do our own forensic, let's call it off list, uh, reference checks to find out who is this person. Cause we won't always have the opportunity to, to build a, a very long uh, relationship with someone before we invest. We love to do that. Generally, we like to watch people uh, hit milestones and then invest. But if we don't have that uh, opportunity, we have to do an insane amount of um, forensic uh, diligence uh, on the founders themselves. Because that's the biggest risk at early stage. Literally, that is your biggest risk uh, as an angel investor is the founder you're backing. And we don't like taking founder risks. Absolutely. Makes sense. And and another one, you have. Uh, do you consider countries like Thailand, Indonesia as the next big market in terms of fintech penetration? Which one you are investing in the next 10, five to 10 years? All of them, no. <laughs> so <laughs> Indonesia is the market that matters. That's very clear okay. for Southeast Asia. Um, so that will continue to be a very important market for, for 1982 ventures and for fintech uh, in general. Um, after that, our core markets are, are basically Vietnam, Singapore, and Philippines is where we see um, kind of the ripe ecosystem and the, the right conditions to, to really generate very, very large outcomes for, for our investors. With that said, it's interesting that um, the, the, the attendee asked about Thailand. Thailand is becoming way more interesting. And I would say that most VCs over the past five years would have basically ignored Thailand as a market because the corporates are very strong there. You don't see a very strong entrepreneurial startup ecosystem, but things are starting to change. And there's some characteristics of that market that make it um, very interesting for certain uh, e-commerce and fintech business models. So we've already made two investments in, in Thailand. Uh, we're very bullish, uh, obviously on those on, on that market, especially because there's less competition for startups. So if you've got the right business model that works in markets like, say, Thailand or Malaysia, you're not necessarily going to be competing with a lot of copycats uh, or a lot of well-funded uh, competitors, uh, local or foreign, such as you would in Indonesia, for example. So Indonesia, definitely one of the biggest fintech markets to, to keep an eye on. It's, it's just getting started. But um, Vietnam uh, is a very, very interesting market, not just from a fintech perspective as well. But we don't really see any, let's call it uh, yellow flags on most of these markets, but market size matters. So for markets like Malaysia or Laos or Cambodia, it gets a little bit more difficult to, to underwrite for, for 1982. Uh, but as the core markets I mentioned, the other thing I'd like to point out is that uh, Pakistan and Bangladesh, we believe are going to be massive markets. And um, we're already seeing that uh, with, some, with some of our investments there. Uh, one of one of our uh, Bangladeshi investments uh, actually today is one of our highest performing uh, uh, investments at just about 6x in 18 months uh, from a valuation perspective. Those markets are even further behind than, say, compared to to Indonesia. Their VC ecosystem is not even a tenth or a quarter of what it of what India is. And, and a market like Pakistan, in particular, you're seeing real strong institutional interest from the U.S. Uh, and from uh, the Middle East as well. So there's a lot of um, very interesting drivers uh, for that market and. Uh, we we believe things are going to to move uh, really quickly there uh, and represent a large uh, investment opportunity as well. Awesome. Okay. And now from from my end, how can investors work with you? You already covered quite a bit of points, but then also just to con conclude, how the listeners of the podcast as well as also the current session as well, um, it will be great for them to know how they can collaborate. Yeah, and, and maybe I'll, uh, I'll I'll keep it a bit broad at first. So, how you can collaborate with with VC funds as an active angel investor or someone who wants to get involved in the ecosystem. And I hope this doesn't come off 
negatively, but just like everything is showing value. And if we continue to see that this individual is sending us great founders or great talent that we can refer to, to our portfolio companies or potential business development opportunities for our portfolio companies, that really makes a mark for, for a VC fund. And it, it makes us think of, of that person, um, uh, when we have something very interesting, even if they're not invested in the fund, but generally for most VC funds, you're not going to get access to direct deals or co-investment vehicles unless you're an LP. It's part of the, the reason why people invest and, and it's not fair if you, if you, um, give it to people that aren't in the fund. So if you're keen to get access to good deals, find a fund manager that accepts individuals, um, and probably accepts you know, um, modest, modest tickets that wants you to co-invest and, and leave, leave some spare cash, uh, for co-investments. But when it comes to co-investments, I will say, um, that the thing that I think many, uh, individuals don't realize is how fast they move. So we can't wait three months for a decision. You know, here's the memo. We've done our due diligence. We're investing X amount. Um, we've got this much available and we need an answer by the end of the week. That's how fast it, it, it needs to move because allocation in the best deals gets taken up really, really quickly. So, um, to work with us, just reach out <laughs> and you can find my email. Um, you know, I'm, you can, I'll put my WhatsApp on the, in the quid room chat. I'm we're very accessible and we want to work with anyone that believes in our mission of one positively impacting financial services in Southeast Asia and Pakistan and Bangladesh. And two, making 1982 Ventures the best performing fund in Southeast Asia. That's awesome. And for all the investors that are going to be joining the community, listen to this podcast and join your community in Quid Room, what kind of content can they expect in your room that they can get the exposure to to understand Southeast Asia market? Yeah, more than likely, they're going to see a lot of deal activity (laughs) because we're a... um, we're a very active investor. As mentioned, we're the most active uh, fintech investor in the region and we go really deep and very broad. So what I'd like to show the community are one, these are the types of fintech business models that are getting launched, whether it's a corporate expense management platform uh, in, in Indonesia, whether it's a digital tax calculation uh, company that's helping SMEs and micro SMEs um, calculate and, and pay tax, which generally people don't like to do <laughs> in most markets. But when the government and, and all the platforms are making it necessary, uh, this platform makes it easy. If it's a crypto payments gateway, allowing large businesses, multinational businesses to accept crypto, crypto payments without ever having to touch crypto. There's such a wide world of fintech and we want the community to see the different types of business models that are being launched right here in our backyard in in singapore and across across southeast asia then i'd like to show who's funding these companies after us because that's what i think is the most exciting part is that when we back a company three six nine months later to see a sequoia to see um a head of sophia to see an adb to see such beautiful tier one VCs following our deals. Um, it, it really validates our thesis. Uh, but what's more interesting than just deal activity is that we'll probably getting, be getting pretty deep in business models uh, as well in landscapes uh, of the markets. So doing landscapes of Indonesia, doing landscapes of Vietnam. That's awesome. Well, that's it for now for me, uh, Hassan. And thanks for answering all the questions from investors. It was great to have you on board today. And for all the listeners, please join Hurston's uh, investor community in Quidroom. The handle is in the comments here. Let's make investment better one step at a time.